I want to welcome everyone. I'm Jack Klieger, um, museum's president and CEO, Museum of Jewish Heritage, Living Memorial for the Holocaust. It's an honor to kick off today's dedication ceremony for the children's tree, which is a living artifact descended from the Nazi concentration camp in Theresienstadt. With roots born of the Holocaust, the tree, which is now firmly planted in the grounds outside our museum, has branches that point us towards a brighter future. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our partners and friends at the Battery Park City Authority and to all the students and teachers here from PSIS 276. Thank you. <laughs> School plays a very important role, not only in today's ceremony, but what we're trying to achieve and in an ongoing way to the care and the maintenance and the story of the tree. You'll hear more about that. Um, we're calling this silver, ma silver maple the children's tree because of you, children of today, children of tomorrow. By learning about the children who planted and nurtured the original tree of life 80 years ago, you're becoming witnesses to the story of the Holocaust and caretakers of a piece of the history in your own backyard. I'd like to first explain the theatrical set on the stage behind me. In two days, the museum will begin previews for a new program called, a new show called Becoming Dr. Ruth, a four-week theatrical production starring Tover Felchu. We weren't able to move the play set, so we're here within it, dedicating the children's tree at the same time as we prepare to celebrate the life of one specific and remarkable Holocaust survivor something sort of appropriate about that. To begin today's ceremony, I'd like to invite one of the creators of this whole idea and the person who first called me, told me about it. I said, Michael, you're crazy. Here we are. Um, Dr. Michael Berenbaum, esteemed historian. He will tell us the story of the special tree. Michael? I have to say that, um, Jack, that is the most unusual introduction, introduction I've ever received. And I suspect that my wife would agree with it. Let me give everybody, I'm a historian, therefore I'm going to give you a little bit of history for a moment. Treisenstadt was an anomaly among the German camps. It was a garrison city, a ghetto, a concentration camp and a transit camp. It was the anteroom to Auschwitz for Jews from the pr Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, and for special categories of Jews from Germany and Western European countries. There were, these people were called prominence, men and women of influence, elderly, and those perceived as having particular merit because of distinguished service to Germany during World War I. The Nazis artfully and deliberately positioned it as a model ghetto, a place that purported to demonstrate the Fuhrer's decency to the Jews. However, in reality, it was a means of camouflaging the Reich's actual intentions in order to conceal them from the inquiring world. Behind the Potemkin village, the stage was set riddled with fear, disease, and death. The duality, along with the feverish cultural life organized by those interned there, gave the ghetto an almost surrealistic quality. Just 40 miles north of Prague, Treisenstadt was ideally suited for its function. It soon became the home for Jews from Prague and then the Jews of German protectorate. By 1942, in July, the non-Jewish population of 7,000 was expelled, and the town became a closed Jewish village, village with lethal consequences. Treisenstadt resembled a transit camp. People were deported to it and from it, from Bohemia and Moravia in the west, and then beginning shortly afterwards, they were deported to the east, a euphemism for the killing center of Auschwitz, but also Treblinka. Conditions in Treisenstadt were harsh. Statistics revealed just how harsh. 
Some 144,000 Jews were deported to Tresenstadt. Of those, 33,000 died there. 88,000 were deported to Auschwitz. And by the war's end, only 19,000 were alive. 15,000 children were sent to this camp. And by war's end, only 100 of them were still alive. Only one in 200 survived. One half of 1%. And that's the reason why it's so important that we have children here today. In contrast, the, the Jews of Trezen, who were shipped to Trezentat were sent by their home, uprooted from their community. They imagined for a time that they, um, that they would continue, and they struggled courageously but unsuccessfully to maintain as normal life as conditions permitted. At its peak, 53,004 Jews lived in a space that only the year before had housed 7,000 people. Food was scarce. In 1942, 15,891 people died, more than half of the average daily population. Even in its worst year in Warsaw, the death rate ratio was 1 in 10. The death rate was so high that Trezenstadt, that a crematory was built capable of handling 190 bodies a day, 69,000 a year. A crematoria was built, but not a gas chamber. Many prominent Jews came to Trezenstadt, even under the press of the final solution, the Nazis could distinguish between some Jews and other Jews. Some prominents had served their country as war heroes during World War I. Army generals might inquire as to their fight, as to their fate. Others had been scientists, industrialists of national, international re reputation. Inquiries might be made regarding their destination. At least for a while, their well-being might have been of interest to some outside. There were also artists and scholars. But soon, all too soon, the Nazis learned that no matter how great a scholar, no matter how magnificent an artist, no matter how talented a musician, no matter how courageous a war hero, how brilliant a philosopher, few cared about them because they were Jews, and not enough cared about them to make any significant difference. Thus, Trezenstadt became the destination and death place of some of the most promised Czech, Austrian, and German writers, scientists, jurists, diplomats, musicians, professors, and artists. The density of the such talent, the severity of their situation, their anxiety about the future gave rise to a rich cultural life in the shadow of death. Cultural life was intensified because of the looming sense of mortality. There was a lending library of ten thousands, tens of thousands of books. Rabbi Leo Beck, Germany's best-known rabbi, offered courses in philosophy and theology. Beck had been the opportun offered the opportunity to leave Germany. He decided that a rabbi's responsibility was to remain with his community. Still, he spoke of God, and Jews studied about God, even in this ghetto camp. Symphonic music was written, performed in concert. There was a children's opera, Brundabar, theatrical performance, lectures of spiritual inheritance of the community. By day, the artists worked in their workplaces to make art acceptable to the Nazis. At night, they painted a true picture of what life in hiding was all about. Danish Jews came, and Denmark was the only country that asked what happened to its citizens. A propaganda film was made at Trezenstadt showing how well the Jews were facing, fear, were faring under benevolent protection of the Third Reich. When the filming was over, most of the cast, especially the children, were sent to their death. The community was most concerned about its children. This was characteristic of Trezenstadt, but shared in common with other ghettos in Vilna, Judenrat leader Jacob Gans sacrificed the old and cons cons consented to their deportation in order to protect the young and the future of the nation. In Warsaw, Adam Chernyakov would not affix his signature to a deportation order that included the children. 
Prior to his suicide, he wrote a final note. They have asked me to deport the children. This I cannot do. In Trezenstadt, children were educated as if they were middle class or upper middle class Jewish children living under ordinary conditions. They were protected for as long as they could be. A rigorous daily program was developed for them, classes, athletic activities led by an Olympic athlete, and art was pursued. Children's painted pictures, they wrote poetry, yet because they represented the Jewish future, they were among the earliest to be killed. They could not be shielded against deportations for long. For example, in August 1943, 12,000 children from Bialystok were deported to Auschwitz. They had spent only one month in Trezenstadt. The children of Trezenstadt were taught by Bauhaus artist Friedrich Dicker Brindeis to express feelings in drawings. They wrote poetry, words of defiance, words of hope. A 13-year-old Frantisak uh, Bas wrote, I am a Jew and will be a Jew forever. Even if I should die from hunger, never will I submit. I will always fight for my people on my honor. I will never be ashamed of them, I give my word. I am proud of my people, how dignified they are. Even though I am suppressed, I will always come back to life. So much for history, but what do you expect of a historian? Let's talk about the true tree that has been pounded. On Tu Bishvat, the Jewish New Year for tree, one magnificent teacher by the name of Irma Lasher enlisted the help of a guard to bring her a silver maple tree seedling that she and her students planted in the children's quarters. Lasher taught the children interned in the camp a, later, a lesson of great importance. Even those who have so little can do so much. Lasher and the children watered the tree. They took little watering cans, giving of their very limited rations. The tree tribe thrived. She told a Talmudic tale of an old man who planted a fig tree. People asked, old man, old man, why are you planting a tree? Do you think you will live to see its fruit? He answered, my grandfather planted a fig tree, and I have enjoyed its fruit. I may not live to see its fruit of this tree but my grandchildren will eat it and thrive. The planting of this tree represented faith in a future. In this case, a future too few of the children live to see. It also represented spiritual resistance at, it, at its most intense. The enemy could murder and maim, could destroy the body, but it was in the capacity of some, and let's be honest, not all and perhaps not even most, to preserve their whole soul, to preserve their humanity, despite the conditions they were forced to endure. And this was understood throughout the camp. Everybody understood the importance of this tree, as we should. After the liberation of the camp, the survivors placed a sign at its base. As the branches of this tree, so the branches of our people. And when Irma Lasher passed away, she asked to be buried beneath the tree, which grew high to 30 feet. Let's remember that this tree was called the Tree of Life, a word that should echo because that's the name of the synagogue in which 11 Jews were killed in Pittsburgh. A flood later destroyed this Eitz Chaim, this Tree of Life, but cuttings had been made to preserve the tree and then planted across the grove. My friend and my late colleague, Mark Talisman, former vice chair of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, personally took cuttings of the tree, brought them to the United States. The saplings ended up on a farm. And finally, in 2018, one tree was moved to the Philadelphia Holocaust Memorial Plaza on Benjamin Franklin Parkway at the site of the public, first public memorial to the Holocaust in the United States. And today we consecrate this tree, which represents the dream of a teacher and the hope of her well-taught students, that the tree they planted would bear fruit, 
Let's remember 15,000 Jews were deported to Kresenstadt. Less than 100, one half of 1% survived. So the children who planted this tree did not have children and grandchildren. Their future was taken from them. But the tree endured, and so too its story. And we, and most especially you children who go to the public school of PSIS 276 across the street, and those children who visit the museum must become the grandchildren who will remember this tree and its story and enjoy its fruit. We and they must learn, even those who have so little can do so much. And despite the hardness of the conditions that one may face in life, despite everything, one can preserve one's humanity, one can preserve one's soul, one can dream of a different future. Let me conclude with the words inscribed by a nameless Jew on a prison cell in Nazi Germany, which speaks of them and speaks of now. I believe, he wrote, in the sun even when it is not shining. I believe in love even when I cannot feel it. I believe in God even when God is silent. Thank you, Michael. Beautiful and moving remark. Museum in this whole area, whole city, owe a great deal of gratitude to you, for your leadership and vision in bringing the children's tree to the museum. We also want to extend our deep appreciation to Mr. and Mrs. Bud Newman, Mr. and Mrs. Roger Palm, Dr. Roger Pomerantz. Beth Riseboard and Charles Day for all their work in getting this tree from Europe, Philadelphia, and eventually, finally, to New York, where it will be its home. And to the late Mark Talisman, who was the first to bring this great story to the United States. We'll now turn to this morning's featured guest, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, who serves as the U.S. Representative to the United Nations and as a member of President Joseph Biden's cabinet. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield has been a distinguished diplomat for more than 35 years, serving among other roles as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Director General of the Foreign Service, and Ambassador to Liberia. Even more important than her distinguished title is the Ambassador's very deep and heartfelt commitment to learning and acting upon the lessons of the Holocaust. She is clear-eyed about the dangers posed by anti-Semitism and hate in our world today. Every day at the UN, Ambassador Greenfield fights for good with the weight of our country behind her. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield to the stage. Good morning. Thank you so much, Jack, for that introduction and for hosting this remarkable event and for inviting me to share in this honor. And Michael, thank you so much for the extraordinary historical perspective you just shared with me and all of us in the audience, but particularly with the young people who are here in this room. It is such a privilege for me to be here today I'm particularly honored by the presence of survivors and descendants and representatives of survivors who are here in this room. Your legacy, your courage, your insistence in telling your stories move me beyond words. We are so fortunate to have you here with us as Holocaust survivors are becoming more and more rare around the world. That is in part the great value of museums like this one. It can tell survivors' stories. 
even in their absence, and make real what happened there and ensure one important lesson we should all learn, and that is we should never, ever forget. Every museum has its own way of doing that. Here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, during a visit earlier this year, my heart broke wide open when I saw children's shoes from a concentration camp, gray and tattered, with little socks rolled up inside. They in unlocked something inside me, and they invoked the real children who had worn them. When I was at Yad Vashem during my visit to Israel just a few weeks ago, a different display struck me. There was an exhibit that showed what people who arrived at concentration camps had in their pockets. Simple items of daily life, watches, wedding rings, family photos. Think of what you have in your pockets today that might share with whomever should, should find your remains might share about you. Today, I have a handkerchief in my pocket that I grabbed from one of my staff as we were getting out of the car because I have a tendency to cry at these kinds of events, and they want to make sure that I don't have tears rolling down my eyes and no Kleenex to, uh, to wipe my eyes. And I wonder if someone were to find my remains, if they would know why I'm carrying this handkerchief in my pocket. We're all moved by different exhibits, different ways of telling the stories of the Holocaust. For me personally, the story of this tree is one of the most powerful I have ever come across. Often in my work, I hear about hopeless places, places of widespread suffering and darkness, places where hope supposedly goes to die. It would be hard pressed to think of a place more potentially apt for that terrible moniker than Terezin. And yet, we have before us today proof that hope did not die there, that a teacher in the most dire circumstances smuggled in a lesson, that students took their meager water rations and put aside some of it for that tree, that even though most of the children were deported and perished in Auschwitz, hope lived on through their efforts. This tree shows us that even in places where hope supposedly goes to die, human spirit endures. After all, what is more hopeful, more optimistic than planting a sapling? It is an act of pure generosity to water protect and care for a sapling whose leaves you may never sit under. We do not plant saplings for ourselves, as you heard from Michael. We plant them for the next generation. Or in the words of the sign survivors placed in the base of the tree after liberation, as the branches of this tree, so the branches of our people. I know the Jewish people will continue to branch out, just as the saplings from that original tree in Terezin thrive all over the world today, and you will have one here that will be your reminder. And I know that the students of PSIS 276 will take good care of this symbol of hope, which will in turn move and inspire generations of children to come, and I urge you to appreciate the opportunity that you are experiencing here today and you will experience for the rest of your lives because you've had the opportunity to take care of this, this sapling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Greenfield, for those powerful and moving remarks. And we're, we're honored by your presence today. Greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate the work of your staff in arranging that. The story of the children's tree, which 
which Michael shared with us today, is powerful not only because of the inherent power of the tree itself, but because of the people involved, the teacher and the children, Theresenstadt, who endowed the tree with meaning by caring for it. In honor of Irma Loscher and the children who planted the original tree of life, we will now turn the program to Holocaust survivors, descendants of survivors, children in our own community who will lead us in song. We will also have remarks by Consul General Arnish Karas um, of Czechoslovakia. Um, but first, I'd like to call to the stage the museum's senior director of education, Paul Rodensky, to read a passage. Paul. On November 17th, we planted a tree in front of the museum, which is a descendant of the tree that was planted in Theresienstadt on the Jewish holiday of Tu B'Shvat during the Holocaust. It was an awesome sight to see the tree coming off the truck and being put into position and planted. The Talmud is the basic work of the Jewish religion. It covers some 63 tractates and goes on for 2,711 pages. In Poland, between World War I and World War II, Rabbi Meir Shapiro created a program to study a page of the Talmud each day. This program is called Daf Yomi. It takes seven and a half years to complete the entire Talmud. On November 17th, we studied page five of the Tractate Tanis. This page records the conversation of Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Yitzchak. Their conversation ends with the following exchange, which I'd like to share with you. When they were taking leave of one another, Rabbi Nachman said to Rabbi Yitzchak, Master, give me a blessing. Rabbi Yitzhak said to him, I will tell you a parable. To what is this matter comparable? It is comparable to one who was walking through a desert and who was hungry, tired, and thirsty. And he found a tree whose fruits were sweet and whose shade was pleasant, and the stream of water flowed beneath it. He ate from the fruits of the tree, drank from the water of the stream, and sat in the shade of the tree. And when he wished to leave, he said, Tree, tree, with what shall I bless you? If I say to you that your fruits shall be sweet, should be sweet, your fruits are already sweet. If I say to you that your shade should be pleasant, your shade is already pleasant. If I say to you that a stream of water should flow beneath you, a stream of water already flows beneath you. Rather, I will bless you as as follows. May it be God's will that all saplings which they plant from you be like you. So it, is, so it shall be with you. What shall I, with what shall I bless you? If I bless you with Torah, you already have Torah. If I bless you with wealth, you already have wealth. And if I bless you with children, you already have children. Rather, may it be God's will that your offspring shall be like you. May we be full of learning and deeds, and may we merit to educate and raise new generations who will also be full of learning and deeds. And may our new tree serve as a source of inspiration, as did its illustrious ancestor. Now we will turn to the voices of the survivors in our community who experienced Theresienstadt firsthand. First, I will invite Theresienstadt survivor Fred Turner to the podium to share his reflections. After Fred speaks, uh, we will hear from uh, Suzanne. Uh, we will uh, we will hear from Susanna Justman's reflections, read by the Czech Consul General Arnoš Karish. Uh, later today, the museum will post a video of remarks by Theresienstadt. Uh, by Theresienstadt survivor Rene Slotkin, which will be read by his wife, June Slotkin. Please join me now in welcoming Fred Turner.
want to thank you for remembering remembering Terezin and remembering the children of Terezin. What is most on my mind are memories and the one thing we carry on I've noticed there are speech I remember one thing I wanted to what is it made us persevere when things got very different? The community of Terezin is fueled set was a civilized and moral community. And you see, I think that is what helped, what helped me. There is awareness, there is such a thing as human human behavior. This is what keeps me going to this moment. And I want you to thank I have you to thank for keeping that memory alive. That is, you're doing the one thing that we try to do, to remember and do the right thing. So thank you. Thank you for being here and being part of the, the memory that we do try to keep alive. It is not valuable. These are not valuable things that we cherish, but that we wear in Terezin, a form of a civilization that went on while around us there was death and destruction. So thank you for being part of that memory. Hello, everyone. You know, Your Excellency, dear President Jack, Board of Trustees, ladies, gentlemen, and I, I have to mention, you know, I cannot forget, you know, all kids here, you know, fifth graders. Great to be here. It's really m <clears throat> a ceremony that it's both moving for me, you know, and emotional and, and, and rewarding as well. Since half of my uh, family perished in Auschwitz, uh, they went through Terezin, Terezinstadt, so uh, it's really touchy and an emotional ceremony for me. Uh, I'm standing here, as, as mentioned, you know, on behalf of Zuzana, Zuzana Justman, she cannot make it, and then I'll, I'll do my best, you know, to, to replace her. Zuzana Justman is a New York-based Czech-American Emmy Award-winning filmmaker and Ryer, who spent two years in Terezin as a child. Although she was not able to join us today, let me please read some of her reflections aloud. The following is ex ex excerpted from her 2019 article she published in, a, in the New Yorker title, titled My Terezin Diary. Mariana Kornova and Jiří Sátz both lived close to me. Mariana was a gifted writer, and she and I, I liked to collect words and expressions that struck us as thought. 
we wrote them down on a little pieces of paper that were that we sometimes buried. I still have a scrap of bank paper with in flagranti and negligee written on it. I knew Yiri from the Jewish school in Prague, where he was the most popular boy in my class. In Terezin, my mother and I had been assigned places in the attic, a large area under the roof of Q306, a two-story sorry house divided in two sections with about 40 women and children on either side. When I arri arrived <clears throat> at my new quarters, I was thrilled to see that his bed was not far from mine. Iri, or Irka, as I called him, had an eight-year-old brother, Petriček, who used to entertain the attic inhabitants in the evening by performing a parade style song. The adults were convinced he would grow up to be a big star, adored him, but Irka and I thought he was annoying and we would try to escape him when he followed us around. Irka's job was to herd sheep on the camp rampart. I sat with him sometimes while he watched them and one day he engraved. Here sat headed sheep in year 1944 on a little wall high up on the rampart with our initials J and Z intertwined underneath. A few years ago the inscription was still there. Mariana, Irka and Petricek all perished in Auschwitz. Today we have honor to strengthen of Susanna Justman and the memories her friends who perished. As children in Terezin, their stories are reflected in children's tree. Thank you so much. My name is Mara Sunenschein, and I speak today as a member of several communities with links to the children's tree. I am a descendant of Doretta Rose, my great-grandmother, who died of sepsis at Brazenstadt in November of 1942. Since 2010, I am a resident of my favorite neighborhood in the world, Battery Park City. And since 2017, I have also worked in Battery Park City as an employee of this museum. Like the children's tree, I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, the city where my father, his parents, and his younger sister settled after fleeing Europe in 1939. And I am a parent of a seventh grade student at PSIS 276, the Battery Park City School. My daughter's name is Phoebe Rose Channon, her middle name a tribute to her great-great-grandmother, Doretta, and our many family members whose lives were stolen by the Nazis. Upon arrival in the United States, my grandmother, Doretta's younger daughter, initially found work in New York City, so she stayed here for a period when her husband and young children moved to Philadelphia. On the few occasions where she had some time to herself, she would take the subway to Battery Park, sit on a bench overlooking New York Harbor, and plead for the safety of her family left in Europe, directing her wishes to what she referred to as her only friend in America, the Statue of Liberty. Today, just a few blocks north of Battery Park, we dedicate this tree that, like my family, has roots in Theresienstadt, Philadelphia, and now New York City. The tree will be cared for by students who go to the school where my daughter has been a student since kindergarten. Trees form communities, root networks used to share information and resources, 
The children's tree, newly planted in, the in front of the museum, will become part of a root network of trees. But it will also be a member of the human community that lives here, works here, goes to school here, and visits the museum. I welcome the children's tree to our community, and I am grateful that this silver maple will inform generations to come of the sacrifices Irma Lauscher and her students made to grow a tree in Theresienstadt in 19. And now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage the advanced student chorus at the Battery Park City School, led by the school's choral director, Krista Bruschini. They will sing Let There Be Peace on Earth, a song suggested by National Yiddish Theater Folks Bina Artistic Director, Salman Mlatek. Good morning. Ambassador, I may need to borrow the handkerchief in your pocket. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm BJ Jones, President and CEO of the Battery Park City Authority. Thank you to the student chorus for your beautiful voices, 
and another reminder of what today is really about. To say that we're honored that the children's tree is taking root here in Battery Park City is an understatement. It is fitting that it is here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. I'm deeply moved by the stories associated with this tree, stories of unspeakable atrocity and inspiring resilience, lessons that we should all remember as long as it grows outside the doors of this vital institution. To have helped plant this tree, dedicate it today, and maintain it for this and the coming generations, it goes to the heart of what we strive for here at the Battery Park City Authority and through our longstanding partnership with the museum. This includes building and promoting an inclusive, diverse, and livable community, accessible and welcoming to all, creating programs that invite and enlighten, and making our public spaces vibrant with installations of civic and cultural significance. This tree is an important symbol of why we must continue to fight intolerance and foster greater inclusivity and understanding, both locally and globally. And to all of the students here today, I really hope you understand that what you do here, even in this little corner of Manhattan, can change the whole world for the better. So to Jack and your team, Ambassador, survivors, students, parents, all of the distinguished guests, welcome to you and to this historic and powerful addition to our natural landscape. It's a solemn honor and it also gives me great joy to say the children's tree today, tomorrow, always has a home here in Battery Park City. Thank you. One handkerchief, Ambassador. Thank you, BJ. <laughs> Should have brought some. Thank you, BJ, for your steadfast partnership and support. And thanks to the amazing students of PSIS 276, Battery Park City School, for that rendition. Let there be peace on Earth. Inspired <clears throat> us all. Um, this marks the conclusion of the indoor portion of today's dedication ceremony. In a moment, we'll gather just outside the museum's front door, next to the children's tree, to formally dedicate and water the tree. I invite all of the dignitaries, neighbors, parents, and other adult guests with us today to leave your seats now and meet us outside. Before I do, I do want to take this moment to particularly thank Brian Torres of the Battery Park City Association uh, for helping for guiding the project along with Charles Day, our two horticultural specialists, to make sure the tree not only was transplanted, but that we fulfilled our promise to Newman, Dr. Pomerantz, that we will give it healthy space. That's our commitment. So thank you all for that. Um, and that's up to the students to help with that, too. So you got a job to do. Um, with, uh, we'll continue the ceremony in a few minutes. I'd invite the dignitaries, the neighbors, the parents, and other adult guests with us today to leave your seats now and meet us outside. To the students and teachers, please sit tight for another few minutes until the adults in the room leave, and then you're welcome to return to school <laughs> for the day. <laughs> Thanks. You thought you were going to get away, but no, but you were, th you're, we're deeply grateful you were able to join us. Thank you, everyone. I'll come around this way.